but I know that it is a popular hobby with some people. Not just nerds, either. Normal... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's mine to sell, though. I mean, I do own it. It's been in our family for a long time. There's some in there, 18-something, which I have no idea if they're real. I guess they could be fake. To my luck, they probably are fake. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins, here with my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. The Broadway season has started out with an extremely satisfying and, may I say, well-made play. We have with us here tonight, it's playwright Teresa Raybeck, our good friend, back on Broadway for the first time. Back on yeah. Broadway. Back, <laughs> back on Broadway. We're on Broadway the first time. Yeah. And You've the, finally gotten from off-Broadway to Broadway. After all these years, Teresa, you've made it. Oh my God! <laughs> I, you know, people have been saying that to me, and I'm like, "What were those ten plays off Broadway?" We had like <laughs> that whole body chopped the liver. <laughs> you know, I like have two full volumes of plays. Well, you got to Broadway, Broadway because yeah. of you because have now for the first time a wonderful, first-rate, first-class Broadway you. director. Yeah, I know. I know you're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> what and, a deft segue <laughs> that was. Yes, all right. Doug Hughes, uh, first time guest on Theater Talk. I'm very honored to be he here. He directed a play that we really love, Doubt, and a great production of Inherit the Wind last season on Broadway. Welcome to Theater And Talk. a few Thank other things, kindly. too, as a well. A few but minor things. Yeah. Doug is now also taking over as the artistic director. I'm what's, actually called what's the title? resident director at the Roundabout Yes, the resident. Theater. Forgive me. So what does that mean? You have to direct everything <laughs> there at the Roundabout? I'm, I'm direct, I don't know. As soon as I had a fancy title, I'm directing nothing at the Roundabout. <laughs> you're you're uh, working uh, at Theater Club. Uh, yeah, yeah. New play, Mauritius. I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I'm an ambassador uh, with, uh, with a broad portfolio, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to, they'll think of something for me to do shortly. Mm. But now, now, Teresa, Susan, uh, calls this play a well-made play. I would say neoclassical. In, Thank you, Mark. <laughs> I would say that, too. This is, this, this is a play, and we don't want to give away the twists and the turns, but it's a play about a young woman who has in her possession some very, very valuable stamps. Um, but it's so deftly done with intrigue and people trying to get at the stamps. What was the impetus, the inspiration, if you will, to write this kind of well-made neoclassical <laughs> style play? Um, I actually think a lot of my plays uh, drift toward the neoclassical <laughs> in their, in that they um, they always uh, sort of, st the nugget of the beginning of everything is as sort of built on story and character. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I, I've never been really one to drift into... Uh, you know, deconstructed muddles. Ephigenia. Uh, <laughs> right. although, although I did finally kind Not of write a, names, but a <laughs> deconstructed play that's going to be done at Denver this year. Um, but uh, mostly that's where I tend to live. And um, and I, I think that this one, uh, I, I, uh, I found that what everyone had gone through and or what many of them had gone through previous to the play that these characters would not talk about their past and so that the entire play became about forward motion in a way mm. um, and uh, that 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 kind of that there was a more ferocious drive they had more hunger to break through whatever had been blocking them to get to the end of the play. Mm. <laughs> but well, where are we in the theater Doug that when I sat in your play Mauritius and then that there was like an end that resolved things I was flabbergasted. <laughs> I went, <laughs> you know, I went, wow, there's a beginning and a middle and an end. How refreshing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great achievement uh, uh, to earn an ending. And uh, Teresa does uh, one of the things that I think is, you know, the 10 point degree of difficulty with this script, which is turn it around within the last 30 seconds. Uh, there is uh, some astonishment yes. offered. And uh, and that is an extravagantly deft thing to do. Who does that? Hitchcock does that. Billy Wilder does that. Lawrence uh, and Lee used to do that. I mean, the great old American yes. playwrights. Yes, and I and I I find it it's it's earned. It's unsentimental, and it's richly satisfying. It's uh, it's an accomplishment. But let me ask you though, from what I heard though, did you have the ending in place right away, or you were really no? Working I truly, up? I truly found the play as I as I wrote it. I started it earlier than I I usually. St I mean, usually I think about things a long time before I start writing, and uh, there were sort of bizarre circumstances that conspired to necessitate that I write 20 pages of this play well before I was ready. And so I wrote the first 20 pages and I was not sure what I had at all. And then some people saw it and there was sort of 
a real liveliness to the reception of it. And, and so I was relieved, but completely unprepared. And so I had to just keep proceeding without actually knowing what was going to happen next. And so honestly, I finished the first act and I thought, I have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, I, the, the play truly led me through it. Well, when did you writing. decide to write a play about the about dark and sleazy world stamp. of stamp collecting? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, is this a hobby of yours? <laughs> no, it's not. I'm interested, I have been interested in collectors. Um, I'm interested in the way the human heart kind of uh, yearns for things to fill it and the strangeness of the ob the collectible object and how that becomes something that provides such satisfaction to people and I actually do think Murray Abraham who um, plays the the stamp collector uh, really f has found that that place where hunger and love meet it's interesting though what you say about and I want to get involved in this a little more um, collecting the mania the mania mm -hmm. for collecting because in a way it, it never ultimately with these characters, it never really can be satisfied. I mean, you get the one thing you want so much, but then there's something else that you don't have that you have to keep going. I mean, what's the psychology of that in a character? Well, I think that there's, the, the as Teresa said, the, the notion that there's some hole in all of our uh, souls. I mean, many would find the four of us shooting the breeze about a, a you know, the new season on Broadway or a play on Broadway, a completely eccentric <laughs> way to pass uh, an hour. Uh, what do you do? You've got to fill up uh, this uh, time. You've By got the way, to we kill our guests <laughs> afterwards. You know, satisfy some heat. <laughs> satisfy uh, these uh, longings, and people project uh, their desires onto uh, the wildest things, be they. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Broadway performance or butterflies. You know, butterflies. <laughs> Wonderful and play another the butterfly great play collection. of Teresa's or uh, stamps. I mean, we've spent a lot of time with uh, some uh, high level philatelists, uh, you oh, know, you who are an amazing uh, mm -hmm. bunch. And there's this beautiful, uh, not far from where we are right now in the, in the 30s, uh, there's uh, the Collectors Club, which is a Stanford White building. That's where the collectors gather and discuss things like uh, the uh, postal, uh, the Spanish postal system uh, uh, before they get adhesive really worked up. stamps. <laughs> what are I, they uh, like? <laughs> I attended, a, you know, kind of a fascinating lecture about uh, how uh, uh, mail was handled in the New World uh, in the 16th <laughs> century. No, I'm. You can easily go down these. Uh, rabbit holes and 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 the elegant thing is that these tiny objects open entire worlds uh, a little uh, a slip of uh, paper with the uh, uh, silhouette of Queen Victoria on it has associations which go you know colonialism and trade and uh, imperial uh, development and uh, cultural clashes and People look at these tiny things, uh, achieve uh, uh, ownership of them, and then just unpack boxes within boxes this until sounds you've like got a the, world. This sounds like the structure mm -hmm. of a well-made play. You have a, an isolated well, small no, I, thing that opens right. into a whole universe. Um, and, you know, perhaps that was it, you know, because I just started with the stamps. That, well, what brought you to that? Oh, you know, honestly, it's, it's, a, very, it's a slightly ludicrous mm. story. I was working on something else. I can't even remember what on my computer, and I, the, tragically, the internet is also on the instrument that I write <laughs> on. <laughs> so whenever I hit a wall this. and I feel like, <laughs> uh, uh, I click onto the internet and I start to troll just because I'm like, uh, you know, procrastinating, and I and I followed that little hand. You know that little hand yeah. that shows up, and you go, oh, click on the hand, and it'll take you somewhere. And I truly just followed it until it landed on this um, this web page, which I don't believe exists anymore. I've tried to find it again, but it was a collection. There was some Spanish lord. Again, Spain shows up in Stampland. Um, <laughs> it was a Spanish lord who had some collection that was on, you know, it was a historical collection and it was going on auction. And you could look at, and I, I, I mean, it was sort of, uh, it was a miraculous sort of thing. I kept thinking, really? And the little hand would click on some of the stamps and tell you what these individual stamps were worth. And I clicked on this one stamp and it said uh, it was worth $1.4 million. And I could not 
I, I thought maybe I was misreading it, you know, like maybe it was in pesos or something, <laughs> and uh, and it wasn't. And then I found, and then I started investigating that particular stamp. And this is the and real stamp in the play, the Mauritius. It was and, those two stamps. And yeah. what, is, what is unique about these two stamps? Why are they worth one point four million dollars? They're actually They're together. Million. To, to the two of them together, uncancelled, would be worth upwards of six million. We think maybe at this and point. And do two exist out there, uncancelled? Well, they do on the stage. They do on the stage, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But in um, real life, we don't know. We don't they know. may, they may yeah. not. Perhaps yeah. they'll come to light. I mean, that's the little miracle like that the ignites the play, is yeah. that right. it, yes, it surfaces in an un unlikely place. And that is true with stamp collecting, that those things do surface. There, are, I learned all this incredibly, I thought, interesting things about stamps, like these missionary stamps, you know, that, that uh, are very old Hawaiian stamps and very, very rare. And someone found a whole bunch of them in a, bi a Bible for that, that came down through their family. And they were convinced they had taken them to collectors. And they all said, no, 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 those are, those are forgeries because they had the wrong kind of cancellation marks on them. And then just last year, someone else turned up the historical evidence that, in fact, the cancellation marks were ap uh, appropriate to the period. And so suddenly, this, this handful of stamps that the, this, you know, so the granddaughter of somebody, who, you know, had been carrying around for years, insisting that they were real. Suddenly, they were worth a, a significant Even fortune. More. It <laughs> is a fascinating play. It's, it's a terrific it's play. It's now yeah. at the Biltmore. Yeah. Thank you very much for Mauritius coming. Mauritius by Teresa Rayback, directed yeah. by Doug Hughes. And you Thank must you. stop back by and tell us what's going on at, at the, the roundabout. roundabout. Oh, which you'll have I'll, nothing I'll to do with. I'll be a mole at the roundabout. <laughs> I, already, I already have a few. Yeah, I'm sure door. you do. I've got that theater covered. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for being a guest tonight. Thank you. Talk. Pay me $10,000 and you will. I don't have to pay you one red cent. I don't understand. Not yet you don't. Let us pay it. You sure about that? It's movement, Sterling. Look, look, to be philosophical, and I see no reason not to at times like this. <laughs> when the river stops flowing, all the fish die. <laughs> you give her the money, or we got a dead fish. It takes great courage to murder the first time. That's when you can no longer claim your soul as your own. After that, it becomes remarkably simple. You'd never be quite sure what lay around the corner, would you, dear? Charles Bush has been an off-Broadway fixture for going on, what now, three decades, Charles, is it? That'll do. <laughs> what is with this? <laughs> he had an occasional for foray on Broadway a few years ago with Tale of the Alger's Wife, but it's, it's, I think, fair to say that he has really kept off-Broadway going all these years, going way back to your first show, which was... Vampire, Vampire lesbians, lesbians of Sodom. Sodom. In what year? Ooh, <laughs> uh, two, uh, 1985. 1985. And yeah. since then, there's almost a, a season doesn't go by without a Charles Bush off Broadway show. Really? I haven't. <laughs> it really looks to me, it seems like it's been years. Yeah. I think of you as the incredibly prolific writer and creator of the fabulous feature film Die, Mommy, Die <laughs> in 2003, which you're now bringing to the stage in a mm -hmm. more remarkable accomplishment. And I wonder, Charles, why it is you're bringing your reprising <laughs> you're your role in up. <laughs> Die, Mommy, Die on the stage now for people to see. I'm wondering why would I do that? No, uh, that's not the way I said it. <laughs> uh, it's not you too. You know, first of all, I just want to, I'm so nervous. One time I was on the show and I was wearing this big sweater, big turtleneck sweater, and and evidently it was all bunched up, and nobody, neither of you said a word. Well, talk and I to looked the like I looked like one. Uncle Fester. <laughs> yeah, and I, so now I'm just I don't trust either of you. <laughs> now you look like Aunt Fester today. Uh, now I look no. like I'm doing Star Trek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's because Kate Mulgrew was in your last the, play. Yeah, that's that's a little shirt that she gave you, right? From <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, anyway, back to my play, uh, Die, Mommy, Die. Yes, it, it it's taken a long route to get off Broadway. <laughs> and, uh, it started off as a play, mm -hmm. and and. I did it in, in Los Angeles for a little brief run yeah. uh, in about, I think, around 2000. And then, and while I was doing it, I thought, oh, this would really make a perfect indie film because it, it kind of all t it takes place in this one sort of Beverly Hills mansion uh, with a rather, about a family, so it was a small cast. Mm. So it, very quickly it became a film, rather amazingly so because so many films take, even yeah. a little indie film takes 10 years. Uh, and uh, and then Carl Andrus, who's directed uh, many of my plays in the past few years, uh, thought we should you know do it in New York. And and then I started thinking about it, and, and I just got all these new ideas of, of 
how I wanted to to make the play richer and and how it really it takes place in 1967 and and that, what a fascinating period of course that was and mm -hmm. I mean really the the 60s I think maybe more than any decade other than maybe 1910 to 1920 there was more change in that decade than anything I mean what's the sort of style of movie that you've based this on well, well I you know a friend of mine said that you, you don't satirize movie genres you do subgenres <laughs> you know you're kind of a you know movie you know I'm sort of a, sort of a amateur film historian I guess so you know I do, the movies that interest me wouldn't be sort of just sort of film noir it's right, something right. very very specific in this case it's a a genre that has been called Grand Dame Guignol. Uh, which, <laughs> our sweet child. Yeah, started off with uh, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, right, right. which was this big sleeper hit with Joan Crawford and Betty Davis and showed that, that if you got two aging actresses who needed the work, they really would humiliate themselves on, <laughs> on the screen, and, and a lot of people would like to see it. These movies were kind of horror, suspense films, uh, and they were trying to sort of approach the new sort of 60s, Sensibility yeah. in a wonderfully dated way and now, though. But you can see it, at the time they thought they were really being. But they funky were even in a bit, bit dated back then yeah. because because you know when you see movies in uh, say, from like 1967, which have references to you know acid trips yeah. or yeah. You know, <laughs> the, the new kind of sexuality, uh, Hollywood didn't really have a vocabulary for mm -hmm. that, so they still were using the same conventions from women's pictures of the 30s and 40s, right. but just somehow it's twisted around to to fit this new sensibility. And in rethinking the play, I thought that in a way the characters are doing the same thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, this film producer who's the, the husband uh, has, in 1960, his great moment had been when he defied the, the blacklist. Yeah, yeah. You know, but now by 1967, his form of liberalism is, is uh, being questioned. I thought actually the characters themselves, you know, are suffering the, the same kind of dislocation that, mm -hmm. that you know, since the country did, it sounds rather pretentious. But, um, yeah, yeah so but this is a weighty play. Well, it is, and it's a, it's a light comedy, you know, sort of, th you know, comedy thriller. But you know, I always kind of like to have something else going on at the same time. And, yeah. And in a certain sense, there is. There, I, I am trying to say something about this very odd period of of our history where, uh, you know, the old rules didn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I think actually, though, that that's something that well, I, and, uh, critics have picked up on in your work. I mean, you know, the sort of the Charles Bush image is. Uh, it's fun, light, you're going to be doing your wonderful characters and all that kind of stuff. But I think of a wonderful play of yours, Red Scare on Sunset. Mm -hmm. Hilarious on the surface, but really dealing with a lot of those issues of communism in Hollywood at the time, but not from the traditional point of view. It was rather even-handed uh, um, satire. Mm -hmm. but yeah, some people really didn't get that at all, because at the end, my I played this rather vapid movie actress who, with great nobility at the end of the uh, play, names names, including her own husband, <laughs> for his own good. <laughs> right. but I, you know, I thought that was more interesting to, to do it as a right-wing nightmare than as a, just, you know, the, the obvious thing would be about some poor leftists who's hounded out of their career, and right. I didn't think that was particularly amusing. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but back to the, the current play. Uh, I, I do like to, I always like to uh, ground these genre parodies with um, both, you know, something to say larger, like whether it's the McCarthy era or, or I, I fought the Nazis and the lady in question. I don't think I've ever asked you, when did the whole idea of you doing these roles in drag begin? I mean, you you... Were you you weren't a drag queen, were you? Is it, you were a Never. playwright. <laughs> you were a playwright, but how did th that evolve? Well, I wanted to act, and I just wanted to be on the stage all my life. And I guess I initially thought that I would just have a traditional acting career. Mm -hmm. And then I went to college, went to Northwestern, and it was a big theater department, and I was a theater major. And I just got, you know, the message early on that that I was an odd type and I, you know, I was you know maybe too gay or too thin or too eccentric and that it, it, I was just it was gonna be difficult. Were they not casting you in things? No, I was never in a play ever. <laughs> you were the drama department? Never ever in a play. <laughs> 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 it was really it got me to thinking, you know. And, uh, <laughs> gee, you know, because really, you know, a, a theater department is kind of a microcosm of show business in a way, yeah, and all the same, you know, people yep, wannabes yep, and, yep. and and the people who made it and the people who haven't and, and fallen stars, yeah. and, you know, <laughs> and so yeah, I thought mm, I don't think this is going to happen, and, and then also, you know, I, the other thing was I really couldn't think of a list of parts that I was dying to play. And I thought, if you're going to do something as insane as, as be an actor and starve to death and everything, you should have this long list. I want to play Hamlet and, uh, you know, Peel Gears. Gears. And, you know, <laughs> Cyrano and I couldn't think of anything I want to do. So maybe, you know, Blanche. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I 
started thinking maybe I need to, maybe I could write roles for myself. And, and then I began being ex exposed to more experimental theater because I'm from New York, New York City and when I would come home on vacation and I would see Charles Ludlam yeah. and, and Theater the, of the and Ridiculous yeah, all those yeah, Yes, and the uh, performance group and Jeff Weiss and all these extraordinary perf performers uh, and I thought, oh, a theatrical experience can be whatever I choose it to be as long as I don't and care about making any money. Right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so really I, I began writing seriously just to give myself opportunities to act. And Vampires, Lesbians, and Sodom, that was, that was the first one that you just, we said earlier. That well, yeah, Did you write I, that with yourself in mind, of playing those? Who else? Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, but I'd had this long career. You know, I'd had eight years of, as, as a solo performer mm. where I was not in drag, and I was just wearing kind of just pants and shirt, and I, and I would play. That. Yeah, and I toured all over do? the country. Well, I called it uh, Charles Bush Alone with the Cast of Thousands, <laughs> but it was a whole kind of repertory of pieces that I had developed over the over course of almost a decade. Did you do costumes? And no, no, it was very minimalist. I would just, there'd be no set, maybe a chair, and I was just in a shirt and a pair of pants, and, and I would do these very complicated, they were almost like screenplays, where I played all the characters, men and women, and, and, to, and I loved narrative. It wasn't enough for me to do just sort of a character sketch. Right, right. I, I wanted to tell, I always loved you telling a story, thing. so I'd do this whole thing. I'd spin around, and I'd be the, you know, the old Irish fisherman, and then I'd stand up, <laughs> and I was the, you know, the, the countess, and then, then I was the young man who was looking for the truth of his parents. You know, father's death, and you know all this, and and I, you know, and thing was that you know I did it for like eight years, and it really was like being in vaudeville yeah. because I I learned so much about um, narrative and characterization and 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 performing in front of every kind of audience mm -hmm. and by myself and establishing mm -hmm. a, a relationship with a very intimate relationship with with the concept of of an audience, and and so by the time so after all these years, when I actually got my kind of break when we did this Vampire Lesbians of Sodom play, and, and I just played one role, just one female character, uh, the audience, in a sense, was seeing a rather honed performer because of all these years. Eight years of doing yes, that of, kind of, of doing all this. And I, I used to put it down a lot my first career, but, you know, looking back, and I think, you know, certainly showed a lot of initiative because I never had any kind of management, and I booked myself wow. all over the country mm. for eight years in different cities, and I would just show up sometimes in San Francisco or Chicago or Washington D.C., mm. and I would just show up and I'd make appointments with the different nonprofit theaters and just you know kind of do part of my act, and <laughs> then they, if they liked me, they'd uh, and usually it was just because they liked me. You right, know? right. Uh, now Charlie's you, back. Yeah, yeah, let's so give him a shot. Then <laughs> they said, "Well, here, why don't you come in six months and be." a cheap part of our season where we don't need a set or, or anything, you know. <laughs> I can see that in your plays, though, how that has worked itself out, too, because um, all of the, the, the characters in your plays are so sharp and so distinctive, and you get the wonderful actors like Julie Halston who are sharp and distinctive in themselves to play those parts. Yes. And I can see how you having to play all these parts as one person, you would have to make them that sharp and distinct yes, to separate them from each other. Yes, immediately, and you had to, do it, I had to do it in this, this kind of performance it had to be an yes, immediate thing within the audience can never be confused for even a, a millisecond yeah, yeah. of who that new character is. So yes, it had to be in the writing and in the performance. And that's why it was marvelous when I had my th original theater company, Theater in Limbo, uh, all, all the, the actors in that ensemble had what we used to call their trip. You know, this <laughs> certain uh, characteristics, a, a, a vocal mannerism right. or, or, or personality trait that, that I could write. And it was almost like having an, an old movie studio uh, contract system, <laughs> you know, where I had to, and the challenge was to write uh, a play to fit all the, you know, these eight people yeah. uh, and allow them to do their trip. At the same time, it couldn't be the same play every time. Right. They'd do their trip, but then give them something a little new, a new sh color to it. So mm -hmm. it was kind of great, and I, yeah. I, I miss it. Fascinating, fascinating. Uh, I can't wait to see Die, Mommy, Die, which, you know, like Open everybody sun. else on, on, in the theater is taking a movie and adapting it for the stage. <laughs> well, Young Frankenstein, <laughs> Legally Blonde, Die, Mommy, Die. Well, this was a play, then well, a, movie, that's a play, then a movie, and now a better play. <laughs> and you, better you open play. October 21st, is that correct? Yes. And you're at the, stages. what theater are you at? New your, World Stages. New World Stages, all yeah, right. And it's going to be a very lavish production. This set is going to be just... Gorgeous! It's big, you know, Hollywood mansion. And wow, you've come a long yeah. way from schlepping your one-man show with no props around the country. I know. I, I'm still bringing my wigs in and the shopping, shopping bag. bag. Yeah. Charles, it's always great to see you. You're a terrific guest yeah. and a good friend of ours. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you.